Can you imagine how hard it is to stop Ronaldo from scoring a goal? I used to play soccer. Let me tell you, it's almost impossible. As impossible as peace, Benjamin? Welcome to part two, where we will be looking specifically at Netanyahu's first term and his time in Ariel Sharon's cabinet to analyse his track record when it comes to peace. First of all, a few of you have mentioned that Netanyahu is no different to the Israeli public in terms of sentiment, and I don't disagree. At the moment, I would say there is absolutely no appetite for a peace that involves a Palestinian state. That said, in 1996, when Netanyahu becomes Prime Minister for the first time, over two-thirds of the public of Israel support peace. One of the reasons I wanted to dedicate an entire video to Netanyahu's first term and his time in Ariel Sharon's cabinet is because a lot of people point to the decisions he made in this time to demonstrate his commitment to peace. In his first term, we see the Hebron Protocol, we see the Y Agreement, and when he's in Ariel Sharon's cabinet, we see him voting twice for the Gaza withdrawal. So I wanted to look at those a little bit more closely to see how much Netanyahu actually commits to peace through these agreements. I'm not here to fight reality. Over 30 years, of course, there have been times when Netanyahu has engaged in the peace process. That said, I do not believe that Netanyahu has ever had a genuine desire to make peace with the Palestinians. I'm sure he wants peace for Israel, but I don't think he wants peace with the Palestinians, especially if any kind of peace agreement involves the forfeiture of land. Netanyahu has always acted in his own political self-interest, and the tightrope he creates for himself is particularly evident in the years between 1996 and 2006. Netanyahu makes small changes in this period that change the peace process forever. There are a lot of things in this video that could honestly get their own entire video. So I've had to be judicious about what gets a lot of screen time and what doesn't for the sake of runtime, for the sake of your mind and mine. So there are a lot of things here which are lighter on detail than they deserve to be, but we just can't be here for six hours. When we left Netanyahu in the last video, he was a member of the Knesset, he was deputy foreign minister, and he was really beginning to make a name for himself. So how does he get from there to leader of Likud? Two major things happened during this period, one which we sort of touched on already, the Gulf War and the Madrid Conference. The Madrid Conference was kind of a prelude to the Oslo Accords, it was where a lot of the principles were set out, and this happened while Yitzhak Shamir was still prime minister. David Levy, his foreign minister, got quite upset because Shamir decided he wanted to go to the Madrid conference, but that was meant to take place at the foreign minister level. So he felt that it was inappropriate for Shamir to go. In response, he boycotted the conference. And so Netanyahu went in his place as deputy and Netanyahu got a lot of camera time and he very quickly became the face of the Israeli government. First term? Yes, it's my first term. Member of the Likud it's very party. long, I have to tell you. How, how many members? Throughout the 90s, Likud really tore itself apart. High-level members of the party started taking really low shots at one another, and when they lost the election, Shamir retired. A lot of people thought Mashiach Renz would take his place, but he also just randomly retired, didn't give a reason, just... Nope, don't want to. And Netanyahu would have put his votes with Moshe Arendt if Moshe Arendt had run. But basically what happened was the middle generation completely decimated themselves through infighting, which left the heirs. And there were a few people who competed against Netanyahu, like Benny Begin, Menachem Begin's son. And despite some competition, Netanyahu won the chairmanship of Likud by a landslide. Before we delve into Netanyahu's first term as Prime Minister, we should probably do a brief recap on the Oslo Accords. So the Oslo Accords are actually two documents. The first is signed in 1993. It's the first time Israel and Palestine recognize one another and pledge to end the conflict. The second Oslo Accord, Oslo II, signed in 1995, and this really was a details document. This was the planning document that had how the peace process was actually going to go down. Now, I'm not making a comment here about whether Oslo was good, whether it was effective, all I'll say is it's the most important step we've seen in the peace process in this region ever. Oslo 1, officially called the Declaration of Principles on Interim Self-Government Arrangements, was essentially an agenda for negotiations governed by quite a tight timetable rather than a full-blown agreement. It stated that within two months of signing, there should be some agreement about how Israel's military would withdraw from Gaza and Jericho, and that that withdrawal should be complete within four months. 
months. A Palestinian police force needed to be set up to maintain internal security. Also things like health, education, welfare, taxation, tourism, all of that would be handed over to the Palestinian Authority and become their responsibility. So the Palestinian Authority were expected to have an election within nine months to establish a council that would be responsible for everything except for defense and foreign affairs, which would stay under Israel's dominion. Final status negotiations, we'll go through them in a moment, were supposed to begin within two years. And everything was supposed to be settled within five years. The first really important part of Oslo was of course the mutual recognition. There was a signed letter from Arafat and a signed letter from Rabin and this basically marked the turning of a new page in Israel-Palestine's relationship. Arafat in his letter affirmed Israel's right to live in peace and security, its right to exist and accepted United Nations resolutions 242 and 338. He also agreed to completely renounce violence and to change the Palestinian National Charter to align with the commitments that he had made. Rabin replied with a one letter sentence that said that they would recognize the PLO as the representatives of Palestine in order to begin the peace negotiations. The second important part of Oslo was the acceptance of the principle of partition by both sides. Historically, neither side had been willing to concede any land. They'd both been very committed ideologically to claiming the entire land that made up British Mandate Palestine. But in Oslo, the leaders were obviously willing to consider the possibility of partitioning the land on the 1967 borders. It meant that the ideological component of the disagreement could be put to the side in favor of a workable, practical solution. Oslo II, also referred to as the Israeli-Palestinian Interim Agreement on Gaza and the West Bank, is the details document. It is immense. It covers all the different aspects of the agreement. It's over 300 pages. It detailed the Palestinian election, the transfer of municipal and legislative controls, the withdrawal of Israeli forces from Palestinian centers. It also includes the division of the West Bank into three separate areas, area A, B, and C. Each area gives the Palestinian Authority a different level of control. And these classifications also denoted what areas would be redeployed during different phases of the accords. Area A was intended to be controlled exclusively by the Palestinians. Area B would see civilian authority exercised by the Palestinians, but Israel would stay in control of security. And Area C would stay under Israel's control. When Yitzhak Rabin gave his reasons to the Knesset for committing to Oslo II, they did not take it well. There was repeated catcalling, he was interrupted, people popped up black umbrellas. And that brings us back to the man of the hour, Benjamin Netanyahu, leader of the opposition. So the second Oslo Accord is actually signed during an election period. This election period is the first time Netanyahu runs for Prime Minister. And surprise, surprise, he is very against the Oslo Accords. שניתן את הגבעות ואת הערים שחולשים על, על ביתנו ועל ערינו, ניתן את זה לערפאת ולחבש ולחוואטמה ולכל שאר הפילנטרופים הללו, שיבוא שלום, הם מאמינים בזה. אתה שואל אותי מה העיקר במערכה הזאת? העיקר במערכה הזאת שאני רוצה לחיות, ואיתם אנחנו לא נחיה, איתם נגיע לסכנה, סכנת קיום אמיתית, ולכן אני חרד, אני חרד על ביתי, על ארצי. אני אפילו חרד על בני, זה דבר חדש, יש לי תינוק קטן, אתה יודע. היום הוא נעמד, אגב, בן תשעה חודשים. אני רוצה שהוא יעמוד גאה במדינה הזאת, ולצורך זה אני בא אליכם, פונה אליכם, כדי שאתם תצאו מכאן עם אותה עוצמה, עם אותה חיוניות, עם אותה נכונות להיאבק על העיקר, כי מה שעומד פה על הפרק זה העיקר, ואמרת את זה, ארץ ישראל עומדת על הפרק וכולנו עומדים על ארץ ישראל. His entire platform becomes about never making any agreements with the PLO, concern about the Palestinian police force being armed, concern about any territorial concessions. This is also the first time that Netanyahu hops into bed with the religious right, a courtship that will last him his entire lifetime. 
He started uh, hosting massive anti-Oslo rallies in the street. A lot of people actually criticized him for using the blood of terror victims for political purposes. And to be fair, this wasn't the view of everyone in Likud. Key members of the air generation, Meridor, Olmert, Begin, they were uncomfortable with the peace process, but they did not like the demonstrations in the streets and they did not like cooperating with the radical right. But Netanyahu fanned the flames. He spoke to massive crowds who chanted that Rabin was a traitor and a murderer. Crowds that marched with coffins with his name on it. Crowds that held up signs of Rabin dressed up as Hitler. Now, Netanyahu, of course, claimed that he had no idea these signs were there at these marches. He didn't know about the coffin. Regardless, days later, Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated. <laughs> Let me just say, Shalom, Haver. Goodbye, friend. While many, including Rabin's wife, held Netanyahu accountable for his death, I do not. What I will say is when it comes to power, Netanyahu seems incredibly incapable of predicting the consequences of his actions. He never seems to realize when he might be pushing it too far. A huge part of the reason I don't blame Netanyahu for Rabin's death is he didn't want him dead. This is the worst possible thing that could have happened to Netanyahu politically. So many people blamed him for Rabin's death and it really seemed like his career was completely tanked. Perez, who stepped up for Rabin as his deputy, should have held the election straight away. He would have won, no contest, but he had a desire to win of his own accord and so decided not to hold an election for six months. And this ended up being an absolute lifesaver for Netanyahu, as within those months, extremist terror attacks start up again. Within a few months, extremist terrorist attacks begin with the hopes of undermining the peace process. A number of suicide bombings occur in Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem, killing 59 people and injuring a bunch more. The other major casualty of these terror attacks is of course Perez's election campaign. Who is the person who is known for predicting extremist terrorist attacks, for warning about them, for saying that Oslo wouldn't work. The exact terrorism that Netanyahu had been so vocal about was now a reality. Another really important thing that happens in this six month period, which negatively affects Perez, is that skirmishes break out at the northern border with Lebanon. While responding to the violence, Israel accidentally targets a UN compound near the village of Kana where civilians were sheltering. It kills more than 100 people. Israeli Arabs are outraged by this and they massively turn against Perez and decide to boycott the upcoming election. At this time, Israeli Arabs constitute 20% of Israel's population and make up a very large portion of the Labour Party's support. Netanyahu ends up defeating Perez by 1%. He then becomes the youngest Prime Minister of Israel at 47 years old. Once Netanyahu is in office, he's in a really tough position because he said he would uphold the agreement of the former government, but he really, really, really doesn't want to. You see, if he upholds the Oslo Accords and follows through on agreements, he loses the support of his base and he looks like a hypocrite. But if he doesn't uphold the agreement, then he loses the support of America and he looks untrustworthy. So he has to find a way to technically make progress on peace while actually slowing down the process. On the 4th of September, 1996, Netanyahu and Arafat meet at the Eras crossing at the top of the Gaza Strip and they shake hands. And this is a huge deal to a lot of the Israelis who support the Oslo Accords because it gives them a sense of hope and relief that things might still move forward even though Netanyahu is so obviously opposed to the process. I hope he um, follows through on the agreement. But, um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm worried, I'm scared. They sit down together, they have talks about the peace process, and they promise to uphold the agreements. 
For all the symbolism of that handshake, Netanyahu makes a number of moves prior to any formal agreement with the PLO that I find not only to be antithetical to peace, but quite provocative. And a lot of them have a relationship with final status issues. So I wanna go through some of those now. This isn't technically an action or a policy, but I do think it's worth a mention. And that is the clean break strategy document produced for Netanyahu in 1996. It's ultimately very hard to determine how much it guided Netanyahu and his actions. Given how much pressure he was under with the Clinton administration, I just don't want to make too much of a big deal of it. On coming into office, Netanyahu tasked a group of US officials known as the Institute for Advanced Strategic and Political Studies Study Group on the New Israeli Strategy Toward 2000 with developing a foreign policy strategy for his administration. This group included a number of super influential American neocons who would go on to hold very important positions in Republican administrations. So members included Douglas Fyth, Under Secretary of Defense for Policy in George W. Bush's administration, Richard Pearl, former member of the Reagan administration and chairman of the Defense Policy Board Advisory Committee under George W. Bush, and David Wormser, advisor to Dick Cheney and special assistant to John Bolton. Now this policy document had six pages of recommendations. And their main recommendation in relation to the peace process was to move away from the strategy of the Labour Party, which they felt assumed national exhaustion and took on a posture of retreat. Instead, they wanted this administration to move away from comprehensive peace toward the strategy based on a balance of power. Instead of making peace with everyone, just make peace with Jordan and Turkey. The idea was these strategic allies would tip the balance of power in favour of Israel, and then that could be used to topple the regimes of adversaries using proxy forces and preemptive strikes. This entire way of thinking really moved away from peace accords and moved towards a divide and conquer kind of strategy. In regards to Palestine specifically, the paper called for the abandonment of what it saw as the failed policy of land for peace in favor of a more real politic approach, which focused on the realities of power and which also engaged the United States in a much more proactive way. Moving on to actual policy actions that Netanyahu takes before making any meaningful movement on the Oslo Accords. Remember how we talked about the final status issues and how there was an agreement in Oslo 2 that no actions would be taken which would jeopardize or change facts on the ground in relation to final status issues. Well, now we get to the Western Wall riots. So let me start with a bit of background. Jerusalem is currently split. However, Israel has always been quite insistent that Jerusalem is is the united and unified capital of Israel and that it will not be conceding any territory from Jerusalem to Palestine. Within Jerusalem, the most contentious area is the Old City. And within the Old City, there are a number of quarters and there is also the Temple Mount. This place is considered holy in Islam, in Christianity and in Judaism. For Jews, the Temple Mount is the location of the first and second holy temples, which were destroyed in ancient times. The Western Wall, which you may have heard of, is seen as the sole remnant of the temple. For Muslims, the Dome of the Rock houses the stone which Muhammad ascends to heaven to meet the biblical prophets. It was also the first place Muhammad and his followers directed prayer to prior to Kaaba in Mecca. Now there are tunnels under the Western Wall. They were discovered in 1867 by Charles Warren and their exploration has always been highly controversial, largely because these tunnels do go under the Temple Mount and Muslims are concerned that exploration of the tunnels will damage the foundations of the temple and cause the temple to fall. Especially when you realize that previous excavations have caused damage to foundations in the quarters of the cities above. The tunnels discovered in 1867 are sealed in 1868 because of the controversy. The tunnels were opened again after the Six Day War. In 1982, same year as Raiders of the Lost Ark comes out, the rabbi of the Western Wall decides to unblock the tunnel that goes directly under the Temple Mount because he thinks the Ark of Covenant is under there. It obviously leads to a huge clash the tunnel is resealed again. In 1984, members of the far-right Jewish underground are arrested for a plot to blow up the Dome of the Rock. 
And in 1990, the IDF kill 17 Palestinians and injure 150 more when they're protesting because there is an attempt by a group called the Temple Mount Faithful to lay a cornerstone of the new temple. There are groups in Israel who want to build a new temple where the first and second temple were, but that would require the destruction of the Dome of the Rock. So to build a new temple, to build a new Jewish holy site would require the destruction of the Islamic holy site. This is the deepest wish of God and the prophets that the third temple will be built in end times. We are living in end times. The third temple must be built, should be built and will be built on the Temple Mount. In 1990, the tunnels were opened up again, but there is only one entry and exit for the tunnels, which leads to a lot of congestion because the tunnels are extremely skinny. So the tourism office wanted to open a second entry or exit so that there could be one-way traffic instead of having people double back and get really stuck underneath. The tourism ministry wanted that second entrance to open out into the Muslim quarter, but both Rubin and Perez denied this request repeatedly because they believed it would have a negative impact on the peace process. The reason I have given you so much context on these tunnels is because in the same month that Netanyahu meets Arafat, shakes his hand and commits to continuing the peace process, he orders further excavation of these tunnels. Without the context, you may not understand what a provocation this move was. And it may not make any sense to you why such a seemingly minuscule decision leads to bloody riots which end up unraveling the peace process. The tunnel that hugs the Western Wall has an entry on the south end in the Jewish quarter. Netanyahu decides he wants to go forward with that exit in the north corner, which is in the Muslim quarter. Temple Mount is under the authority of the Islamic Waqf. This excavation is done without consulting the Waqf, without consulting Arafat or anyone in the PLO or any Palestinian representatives. It's done in the middle of the night with the IDF standing on guard. So the next morning there's a big ceremony in the Muslim quarter. The mayor of Jerusalem and future prime minister Ehud Olmert is there. They've put a dummy rock in front of the new exit for the tunnel and he basically gives a speech, bangs it with a hammer and opens this new exit. This is a big ceremony and the Grand Mufti is present at the ceremony, immediately gets on the phone to Arafat and he's like, they're digging under the Temple Mount. One of the chiefs of Israel's security agencies also gets on the phone to Arafat, having heard that phone call and is like, no, we are not digging under the Temple Mount. But by that stage, it's too late because given everything that's been done in the past, the digging for the Ark of the Covenant, the recent attempt to blow up the Temple Mount, he just can't hear it. He can't. He thinks it's, he thinks it's happening. This is a crime, a big crime against our religious and holy places and it is completely against the peace process and it is a clear preaching to what had been agreed upon and what had been signed. So before you know it, protests have broken out. The Israeli police are trying to protect the new exit. There are Palestinians up in the minaret saying that the Israelis have dug under the Temple Mount. People are flooding in to try and protect it. A week later, Netanyahu is accusing Palestinians of giving in to religious fanaticism while simultaneously referring to the tunnel under the Western Wall as the bedrock of Jewish existence. Understanding how provocative this is, Clinton tries to get Netanyahu Netanyahu to close the tunnel, but Netanyahu will not play ball. He says, I will not close the tunnel, which has absolutely no effect on Temple Mount and expresses our sovereignty over Jerusalem. In response, Clinton tells his UN counterpart to abstain rather than veto a UN Security Council resolution that indirectly criticizes Israel for inciting the conflict. After four days of conflict, 74 Palestinians and 16 Israeli soldiers are dead and more than a thousand Palestinians and 58 Israelis are wounded. Netanyahu remained entirely unwilling to close the tunnel, but knowing that he had to budge somewhere, he agreed to move forward the Hebron talks. He felt that the tunnel significantly changed the facts on the ground in Jerusalem and it was worth the compromise. I'm going to do everything I can to facilitate a resolution of this and I don't want to say anything before they get here that would complicate that. Thank you. Right, the tunnel is open again. What's your reaction?
just because Netanyahu was willing to take part in the Hebron discussions did not mean that he did so with any kind of enthusiasm. He knew further delays were impossible, especially now that he had this pressure from the Clinton administration over the tunnels. And we have our first real tightrope situation because Netanyahu knew that Hebron was unavoidable unless he was willing to break the Oslo Accords and, and ditch the agreement. But he also knew that any participation in the Hebron discussions would be seen as a complete betrayal by his base. To agree to withdraw from Hebron was to throw the idea of Eretz Israel in the bin. It was to endorse Rabin's formulation of land for peace. It would mean abandoning everything he ideologically said he stood for. And many Israelis saw withdrawing from Hebron, a site that is particularly holy to Jewish people, as a practical guarantee of the existence of a future Palestinian state. And Mr. Netanyahu, that I thought that is strong, leader, independent, just proved that Dennis Ross, he is the real governor of the state of Israel, and Bibi became now uh, someone under Mubarak, under King Hussein, under Dennis Ross. What's going on? We fought 50 years for independence to have such a shame like this? Hebron is a city in the West Bank. It is part of Area A, but it is a particularly holy city for a lot of religions. It was also earmarked as the first of three redeployments that were committed to by Israel as a part of the Accords. The city has a population that is overwhelmingly Palestinian. However, there are a number of settlers in Hebron and a number of those settlers are, are quite extreme in regard to religion and ideology. This is the settlement that Baruch Goldstein comes from and there are other terrorists that come from settlements in Hebron or around Hebron. We have not given up. We're not planning on leaving. To the contrary, we're planning on bringing as many people as possible to live in the city of the Patriarchs. We have plans to continue to build here. We have plans to continue to develop here. And this is what we will do. The Hebron Protocol is a details document which looks at how Israel will withdraw from Hebron. In the Hebron Protocol, they decide that Hebron will be divided into two, H1, H2. One of those areas would be designated to a Jewish population and Israel would maintain control of the entire city's security. This is often pointed to as one of Netanyahu's great concessions in his first term. It is worth noting that everything in the Hebron Agreement was already agreed to at Taba as a part of Oslo too. Netanyahu actually uses Hebron to flip Oslo and make sure Israel is 100% in the driver's seat when it comes to controlling the accelerator and the brakes of the peace process. During the Oslo period, most people understood that Jewish presence would be completely withdrawn from Hebron and that would align with assumptions about final status agreements. Even though it was acknowledged that when a final agreement was made between Israel and Palestine, Palestine would retain a majority of the West Bank and Gaza, no mention of international law or resolution 242 actually is included in the Oslo Accords. And as such, the West Bank and Gaza during the interim period are seen as disputed, not occupied. So in 1997, finally, there are discussions about Hebron and Netanyahu makes it clear that he has no intention of withdrawing Jewish presence from Hebron. In fact, he plans on securing and preserving it. He insists that Hebron is a place of supreme importance to the Jewish people and he insisted that Hebron would remain under Israeli control. We seek to have the Jews in Hebron for all time. We seek to have the tomb of the patriarchs as a place of Jewish worship for all time. We don't deny the Muslims the right to worship there, obviously, but our purpose is to stay, not to leave. And we work the details of the negotiations from that basic purpose. This essentially affirmed Israel's right to settle within Hebron and other areas of the West Bank. Before the Knesset, when talking about the protocol, Netanyahu said, our goals are different than those of the previous government. We are using the time interval in the agreement to achieve our goals, to maintain the unity of Jerusalem, to ensure the security depth necessary for the defense of the state, to insist on the right of Jews to settle in their land and to propose to the Palestinians a suitable arrangement for self-rule, but without the sovereign powers which pose 
pose a threat to the state of Israel. Now, Arafat was also under a massive amount of pressure from his constituents who did not want him to agree to this protocol because they saw the Hebron Protocol as legitimizing 450 settlers in Hebron. Not only was it legitimizing these settlers, but these settlers would be allowed to carry arms. They would also have their own armed guard. They would also get the best 20% of the commercial town center. Israel would still be responsible for water, still be responsible for entrances and exits, still be responsible for security, and still be responsible for overall sovereignty. And what concerned Palestinians was that this would set a precedent for the rest of the West Bank. To be fair, that is exactly what Netanyahu was trying to do. Regardless of their protests, Arafat did sign the Hebron Protocol because he felt that in return he would get a timetable for the rest of the deployments for areas B and C. And he did get a timetable, but it stretched out over a year and there were no specific details and the amount of land that would actually be ceded was entirely at Israel's discretion. Israel managed to really get full control over what would be ceded when and how. Um, and even though I see it as an accomplishment, Netanyahu's cabinet did not. They were very upset. After a 12-hour cabinet session, Benny Begin resigned. Former Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir accused Netanyahu of abandoning all of the ideals of his political movement to appease the United States. He said that Netanyahu was not fit to govern. Ariel Sharon also piped in and said that Netanyahu was a dangerous man for the state of Israel and that he did not believe a single word that left that man's mouth. The most significant changes that occurred in the Hebron Protocol actually happened outside of the official negotiations. First, there's the Christopher letter. The Christopher letter may have been one of the biggest wins Netanyahu secured during his first term, even if the right wing of politics didn't see its value at the time. Netanyahu gets a letter from United States Secretary of State Warren Christopher. In this letter, he not only linked the progress of the peace process to the idea of reciprocity, an idea that wasn't really present in the Oslo Accords, but becomes one of the key ideas moving forward in the peace process, but he moves the conception of peace from land for peace to peace for peace. The Secretary of State also agreed to let Israel define what counted as a strategic military location. Under Oslo II, specific military locations to which Israel Israel was supposed to redeploy were not designated and there was no discussion of the extent to which Israel had to withdraw from Area B. So essentially with this letter Secretary of State Christopher confirmed in writing that Israel had the sole right to determine the extent of territory and the size of redeployment in Area B and the pace at which they would redeploy. He also managed to get a note for the record from US envoy Dennis Ross about these reciprocal obligations and how these obligations will be met immediately and in parallel. I don't, I don't focus on who's the problem, I focus on how we find solutions. Which would be totally fine and reasonable if the obligations of Israel weren't already explicitly agreed to in the Oslo Accords and the obligations required of Palestine weren't very difficult. Four days after the protocol was signed, the Israeli Ministry of Public Affairs published a document which stated that all further redeployments were predicated on the assumption of responsibility for public order and internal security by the Palestinian police. Therefore, Israel's redeployments actually became wholly dependent on whether or not Israel determined that Palestine met its security concerns. First time in the Oslo process, we've made a fundamental readjustment. And we've put on not just a layer of security, but the principle of reciprocity. In the note for the record from Dennis Ross, obligations on the Palestinian side are to fight and stop terrorism and violence. Needless to say, changing the terms on which peace would progress was a significant win for Netanyahu in terms of technically participating in the peace process, but also really making the peace process work for him. Peace is not a one-way street. Peace is a two-way street. We fulfill our commitments and the Palestinians fulfill their commitments. And this is the, the, the outcome of the negotiations will produce a document for mutuality and reciprocity. So Netanyahu signs the Hebron Protocol, gets in a whole lot of trouble with his cabinet, and so I guess looks for something he can do in the meantime to get a win at home. As previously mentioned, there are certain things 
like Jerusalem, that are final status issues, where you're not supposed to mess with the facts on the ground or do anything that will jeopardize the negotiations about those final status issues. Even though settlements and what to do with the existing settlements are mentioned as a final status issue, there is no explicit mention of the building of new settlements or any prohibition of the building of new settlements, which is a massive warps in terms of the Oslo Accords. While it is widely acknowledged that building settlements kind of goes against the spirit of the Oslo Accords and the spirit of peace, it does not technically break any rules to build a new settlement. Rabin had promised not to build any more settlements, but not in writing, and Netanyahu is not Rabin. During the Oslo Accords, Israel agreed that it would not establish any new settlements and it would not expand existing settlements, with the exception of construction needed to meet natural growth. Israel also made an exception for settlement activity in the Jordan Valley and the Greater Jerusalem area. These exceptions were exploited during Netanyahu's first term. Greater Jerusalem, from Israel's perspective, wasn't the area annexed in 1967. It wasn't even the area within Jerusalem's municipal boundaries. And natural growth was never defined as a term. Since the signing of the Declaration of Principles, Oslo 1, in 1993, Israel has interpreted natural growth to not only include population growth from birth, but also population growth by migration. And it has also strongly incentivized moving to a settlement. In some kind of land grab, what we're doing is simply continuing the construction as the community gets larger, as people have children, uh, as the uh, number of families increase, we facilitate the construction uh, close to the last uh, construction that is already standing. During this period, Israel will also build new settlements, but claim they are simply expansions of existing settlements for population growth and refer to them as new neighborhoods, even if they are not contiguous at all. In 1996 alone, so we're talking prior to the Hebron Protocol, settlements grew by 9.4%. Netanyahu spent a lot of money in his first term on settlements. One settlement is different from all the others because it causes a lot of drama, and that is Harahoma, also known as Jabal Abu Ghnaim. Netanyahu declares his intention to build Harahoma settlement on a hill in East Jerusalem in February of 1997. And Netanyahu says, the battle for Jerusalem has begun. We are now in the thick of it and I don't intend to lose. This project would complete a ring of Jewish settlements around the south of Jerusalem and it would cut off Arab access to Jerusalem from Bethlehem and other Palestinian areas in the south. One of Netanyahu's main goals for this term in government is to consolidate control over Jerusalem. So green lighting illegal settlements like this is key to his plan to kind of predetermine sovereignty over the whole of Jerusalem. That way, when final status talks do occur, Jerusalem is already irrevocably part of Israel. This is a last minute call on the Prime Minister not to build here in the middle of uh, the Arab area here in uh, Jerusalem. We think that building a Jewish neighborhood here is uh, very damaging to the peace process. We think that Israel and the Palestinians went a long way and are coming to an understanding. And now to come up with this provocation may lead to conflict, bloodshed, all the things that we've been fighting against for many, many years. Netanyahu was always very explicit about his intentions in regards to Jerusalem and his intentions with Har Homa. He wanted to annex the southeast corner of Jerusalem. When Israel broke ground on the Har Homa settlement on the 18th of March, 1997, the Palestinians obviously protested this decision and this move to start construction on Haroma, and they halted the peace process, saying that international opinion on this decision was uniformly critical. Israel was not upholding their side of the obligations. We were very completely shocked by this uh, decision taken by the government. Uh, first of all, the first one uh, concerning the settlement of uh, uh, Abu Ghnaim Har Haroma which is uh, a very dangerous uh, decision. Abu Ghnaim have to stop. Without stopping, there is no integrity for this peace process. And there is no integrity uh, for the negotiations. We cannot preempt the negotiations and then talk about something that's being created on the ground. And what the Israeli government is doing here in uh, Jabal Abu Ghnaim and other places, it is really affected, destroying, not only the negotiations, but the whole peace process. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright did ask Netanyahu not to go through with the construction, please halt construction. Today's decision by the Israeli government to build housing in Har Homa is not a step that will build trust and confidence. Frankly, 
the United States would have preferred a different decision. It would have preferred that this decision not have been taken. But at the same time, the United States vetoed multiple UN resolutions uh, regarding halting the settlements. The United States, Israel and Micronesia were the only ones who voted against a General Assembly resolution condemning the building of the settlement. Mr. President, you have heard our views on the inappropriateness of outside interference in the direct negotiations between the parties. We have never believed, despite the useful role of the Council, can and has played in working for Middle East peace, that it is an appropriate forum for debating the issues now under negotiation between the parties. By the end of 1998, the peace process was completely frozen, so Clinton intervened to try and get it back on track. Clinton is also concerned about the peace process. It's very much his baby in terms of a massive achievement that he's made during his time as President of the United States. Clinton threatened Netanyahu. He said that his administration would withdraw entirely from the region, obviously an empty threat, but empty or not, it did restart negotiations. This week's talk at Y River offered the chance for the parties to break the logjam and finally take the next essential steps for peace in the Middle East. He did not negotiate with grace. In fact, many reports of his attitude during these negotiations is that he behaved like a child. But apparently he threatened to walk out. He got into a screaming match with Bill Clinton at 4 a.m. Ariel Sharon refused to shake Arafat's hand. The conference had to continually be extended because no one could come to an agreement. And there has not been closure. Uh, this is something the leaders are discussing. Every single detail that could be fought over during these negotiations was fought over. And I'm not saying Arafat was a saint. He was not being agreeable either. The purpose of Hebron had been to implement the redeployments outlined in Oslo II. Come 1997, where we are now with the Y River, nothing had really been done. There was very little movement in terms of the redeployments. So why was basically the Hebron Protocol take two? <laughs> with a more concrete timetable and phases. Under the Labour government during Oslo discussions, the territorial debate centered around whether or not the whole of the West Bank would be transferred to the Palestinians, in which case Jewish settlements would either need to be moved, evacuated, or some agreement would need to be reached in regard to land swaps so that settlements could stay where they were, but they could remain under Israeli sovereignty. But once Netanyahu was in power, that thinking was totally off the table. And understand that we received a very, very bad agreement that we have worked and labored to plug the holes in it, and we have plugged many of the holes in it, uh, and to improve it. We've, uh, I think we've got a better agreement, a more secure agreement, an agreement that leaves Israel in an infinitely better position to enter final status talks. The new maximalist position in terms of ceding territory in the West Bank was 13% of Area C being transferred into Area A and B. Netanyahu didn't even want 13%, he wanted 8 to 9%. That's what he was pushing for. In the Y agreement, Israel does agree to transfer 13%, but it is worth noting that only 2% ever does get transferred. However, as a part of the Y accord, Netanyahu managed to deepen the dam caused by the Hebron Protocol. And he also managed to get a lot of concessions out of the United States. The United States agreed to turn a blind eye to Har Homa, and in exchange, they got to waive the Jerusalem Relocation Act of 1995, which would have had them moving their embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and they just didn't. Israel agreed with the Palestinians that they would stop constructing in the West Bank if Palestine agreed to defer the Declaration of Independence until May of 1999. That didn't end up lasting very long, but... um. It was an agreement made. Netanyahu also managed to get America to pay for a lot. So America paid for the construction of bypass roads. America paid for defense and deterrent capabilities. America covered all of the costs of redeployment activities. And America paid for any infrastructure related to settlements that was required. But I want to look at the really important concessions or wins that Netanyahu gets as a part of why, because they are incredibly important, in my opinion, in regard to how the peace process progresses from here on. Once again, Netanyahu uses the Y Accord as an opportunity to further entrench his ideas about security and reciprocity. 60% of the Y Memorandum is taken up with discussions about security, with even the sections about Israeli redeployment focused on Israel's security needs. Security in this document seems to be a unidirectional concept that only applies to Israel's security concerns. 
The Y agreement outlined a timetable whereby deployments would take place in three phases over 12 weeks. Each phase was contingent on whether or not the Palestinian Authority was able to comply with certain requirements, commitments, as determined by the CIA. The first phase would only take place after a security work plan had been devised and shared with the USA and begun to be implemented by the Palestinian Authority. We will talk about that in a moment. Another requirement for the first phase of redeployment was a reaffirmation by the PLO of a letter Arafat sent Clinton concerning the nullification of certain clauses within the Palestinian National Charter. The second redeployment was linked to the actual renunciation of the Charter by the Palestinian National Council, the Central Council, the PLO Executive, the PA Cabinet and Legislative. And this seems like not a very big sacrifice because obviously there are a lot of connotations to violence within that Charter so it makes sense that they would renounce it but it also does kind of rewrite history in that what is seen as as a national struggle of liberation. Without that charter, all of those historical events are kind of understood as just random acts of terrorism. But they did it. As a part of that, the Palestinian Authority was also required to collect weapons. The final redeployment, which would reclassify some areas in the West Bank, was conditioned on Palestinians carrying out other security tasks to a level of satisfaction for a trilateral committee that was set up. All up, if all of these measures were met, the Palestinians would be transferred just over 12% of occupied territory and 3% of that 12% were classified as nature reserves. So they were not available for habitation or commercial use or they, they were just off limits. So just to be clear, Netanyahu's concept of reciprocity was for Palestine to make a number of uni-dimensional security actions be put into a pseudo probation and if they were successful, they would gain partial control of just over 12% of their occupied by territory. So I want to look a little bit closer at this work plan for terror that Arafat agreed to develop. The Palestinian Authority agreed to develop a zero tolerance work plan for terror in order to combat terrorism and they shared that with the United States. As a part of this plan they were required to apprehend individuals suspected of perpetrating acts of violence and terror for the purpose of further investigation. You mark that. Some of the security requirements explicated in the Y agreement are concerning when it comes to human rights and that concern ends up becoming a reality when the Palestinian Authority implement this zero tolerance work plan for terror. Now the Palestinian Authority were required to outlaw and combat terror terrorist organizations. And not only was the Palestinian Authority expected to combat terrorism, they were also expected to dismantle their infrastructure. Working with the CIA, the Palestinian Authority would try to dismantle terrorist organizations, their finances, their supplies, their infrastructure. You guessed it, we have to talk about Hamas. Obviously, in light of October 7, discussions about Hamas are particularly sensitive. What Hamas did on October 7 was an atrocity. Their there is no excuse to massacre civilians. Any discussion of Hamas in this next section is not an attempt to redeem them or support them or anything like that. I'm just trying to state some complicated facts about the relationship between Hamas and Palestinians in the 90s. But when it does come to Hamas, they're kind of like a chimera. They transform really easily into lots of different things. So they're definitely a terrorist organization. They're also a military organization. They're also a political party. They're also social services and a welfare group and a charity group. And and that fluidity makes Hamas really difficult to combat. In the 90s, the Palestinian economy is very, very bad. And the social services provided by Hamas have become critical to Palestinians in the occupied territories. As the Palestinian Authority worked to combat Hamas, they were also getting rid of supplies and infrastructure that was used by a majority of the Palestinian population for non-terror related reasons. Infrastructure of Palestinians, Palestinian people who suffered much under occupation, and uh, uh, not uh, the infrastructure of Hamas. The, these are social associations, and I am astonished for that because uh, uh, the Palestinian Authority closed these associations at the time uh, that Netanyahu uh, announcing and declaring that he is going on uh, in settlements in West Bank. 
Obviously, as a result, there was quite a lot of resentment building within Palestinian society because the Palestinian Authority were not able to fill the spaces left by Hamas in these areas. Palestinian Authority were also required to prevent incitement and the human rights implications of that are quite obvious. What happens with freedom of speech? What happens with freedom of the press? What happens with due process? From a Palestinian perspective, even developing an educational curriculum now becomes quite a sensitive topic. Now, how well the Palestinian Authority complied with the incitement clause was decided by the Trilateral Committee, who developed reports which suggested how incitement should be tackled. So this committee would determine if the Palestinian Authority was arresting, prosecuting, criminalizing intent, and collecting arms to the extent that they could be considered to be acting in good faith. What we need to do is ensure that there is no excessive militarization anywhere, and that uh, issues like this uh, that trigger happy uh, behavior of some of the uh, security branches is stopped. And there should be very stringent and strict requirements about the use of firearms among civilians and the fact that uh, only in self-defense can the police resort to the use of uh, firearms or live ammunition. The Palestinian head of security actually loved that the CIA was involved, even though a lot of Palestinians didn't, because the Palestinian head of security was like, now at least we have an independent third party who can see that we actually are complying and that Israel's claims about our non-compliance are baseless. While it was a technical requirement of both sides to prevent incitement against the other, the idea that the Palestinian Authority could force Israel to reign in their press, or the idea that the state of Israel could be held responsible for the actions of right-wing extremists or the settler community in occupied territories to the extent that the peace process could be suspended and that Palestinians were then free to no longer hold up their side of the peace process is unimaginable, especially when you consider that the very day that the Y memorandum was signed, Israel's foreign minister called on settlers to grab as much land as they could so it didn't fall into Palestinian hands. The Israelis believe that they can go negotiating us for years and years without reaching to any results and in the same time going on building here, there, uh, confiscating land, changing the reality on the ground, expanding their settlements that will not lead to any kind of peace. The implication of the additional commitments, like the work plan for terror, is that previous agreements were not implemented because of Palestinian unwillingness or inability to live up to their security commitments. The structure is premised on the idea that Palestinians are solely responsible for deadlocks in the process. There was no mention of the failure to carry out the redeployment stipulated in the Hebron Protocol in 97 or 98. There was no mention of the multiple incitements by Israel on final status issues. And this is particularly frustrating to Palestinians who had been living under quite a repressive Palestinian authority, who had been doing a lot to live up to their side of the agreement, while Israel had literally been trashing the spirit of the accords. All requirements made of the Palestinians in the Y agreement are binding, concrete, and mechanisms are built in to monitor and verify action. No similar requirements are made of Israel in relation to settler violence or terrorism. Settlers were allowed to have automatic weapons while all Palestinian weapons got collected. No requirements were made of the Knesset to reject any of their foundational documents, even though a number of foundational laws within Israel, not to mention the original Likud Charter or even its replacement written in 1999, both of which are in fact antithetical with the peace process. Even when it comes to redeployments, the very purpose of the document, there is no mechanism for monitoring progress in that regard. Redeployments only occur if Palestinians comply to Israel's requirements to a level that meets Israel's satisfaction. I do quickly want to talk about how Y built on Hebron. One of the key parts of the Y agreement was the codification of the Christopher letter. Incorporating the formerly unofficial letter into the agreement meant that this was now an official part of US policy. The thing about the Christopher letter is it overrides UN Resolution 242. Israel was no longer expected to withdraw from occupied territories as understood by UN Resolution 242. Article 11.2.F of the Second Oslo Accord clearly stated that the extent of redeployment was a final status issue, but instead of following redeployments as decided in the Oslo Accords or, or as required by international law, redeployments would now be made in accordance with Israel's security requirements as defined by Israel itself. 
Redeployment is now based on their own goodwill, rather than being a matter of international agreement. This was a landmark change in policy, as now Israel's territorial claims and security needs are seen as intertwined. And the extent to which those two things are intertwined is decided by Israel. Something you have to consider is that there was a lot of domestic pressure facing Bill Clinton during this period of time. This afternoon in this room, from this chair, I testified before the Office of Independent Counsel and the Grand Jury. So the United States in this instance were happy to settle with the best that they could attain in regard to peace, rather than necessarily pursuing a more principled peace process. Keep in mind, why is the last formal peace agreement that Israel and Palestine have signed to this day? The day Netanyahu arrived back in Israel from his discussions at Y River, he greenlit the confiscation of more land in the West Bank for a thousand more housing units, including the settlement next to Hebron in Kiryat Arba. The Palestinian Authority did clamp down on Hamas terrorist activity and PIJ terrorist activity, and they did annul the parts of their charter which called for the continuation of armed struggle against Israel and the destruction of Israel within a few weeks of the agreement, which was great for Palestine, not great for Netanyahu because he's achieved led to the president, the president of the United States, being like, I'm gonna visit Palestine. And that was seen as strengthening their claims to independence and sovereignty. So the first phase of why had to be implemented. Given that Palestine had verifiably done a significant amount to combat terrorism and they changed their charter. As such, the area between Janine and Nablus went from being solely controlled by Israel to controlled by Israel and Palestine jointly. So that's 2% of the West Bank. To be clear, not a single Israeli settlement was evacuated or moved to under Palestinian control. All settlements stayed under Israel's control. And any settlements that were isolated because of these changes had new bypass roads constructed for them, most of which cut through Palestinian territory. Mr. Netanyahu had frozen everything. Uh, all the negotiations, uh, all the talks, all the uh, committees, uh, uh, everything had been frozen. Palestinians are making a farce out of the Y River Accords. They think they have the United States in their back pocket. I don't think that's the case, but they think that's the case. They think they have them in their back pocket and filling their pockets, basically without accountability. I know that's not the American position, but the Palestin Palestinians believe that is the case. And as long as they believe that is the case, they won't change their behavior. They must comply with the promises they undertook in Oslo and in the Y Accords. They must not unilaterally decide the outcome of the negotiations and declare Jerusalem as their capital. They have no right to do that. So are you confident that you finally achieved a lasting peace in the Middle East? No! No, no. no. no way! No, no way! No! Colin, we will no. always fight. Yes. People love to see us They fight. love this. They love it. Yes. Fairly quickly after the first phase, the Israeli administration suspended the process due to a series of attacks on settlers on the West Bank. The centrist parties in Netanyahu's coalition really wanted the continuation of the implementation of the Y Agreement, but the right wing of his coalition wanted the entire agreement nullified. When asked about why, Netanyahu always defends his actions, saying he did a great deal to wind back the concessions given by the Labour government. This evening I decided to at least know that my conscience was clear that I had tried to offer, to extend my hand to a national unity, to try to unite the people before the enormous challenges that face us to achieve a secure peace. Uh, and uh, if, uh, if that offer is rejected, we'll go to the people. I'm sure we'll receive a renewed mandate from the people to lead this country to peace. Netanyahu did try, but he was unable to put together a national unity government to come to some consensus about the accords. And so the Knesset voted to dissolve and hold early elections. We are not afraid of election. In my opinion, when we go to election, still there is a very big hope that Mr. Netanyahu will come back even much more powerful. And because of elections, Netanyahu suspended why? Because it's not an appropriate time to implement such a political thing. It will have to wait until after the election. As you may or may not know, Netanyahu loses that election. He loses that election because for all that he was able to achieve in terms of repealing the Oslo Accords, the right wing couldn't see it or wouldn't see it. It was never enough. And for those Israelis who did support the peace process, Netanyahu was obviously stalling. He was holding up the peace process at every turn and they saw that. His normal base didn't believe in in him and his opposition also didn't believe in him. Upset by this, he quits politics entirely. Now, 
לפרוש מהנהגת הליכוד. Don't worry, not for long. When Netanyahu was ousted from power, he tapped Ariel Sharon on the shoulder to take over the leadership of Lakud. And he did this mostly because he didn't see Sharon as a real competitor or a real threat. And that was because internally he knew there was enough distrust within Lakud when it came to Sharon. He was seen as a former labor member. And when it came to Israel generally, he felt that Sharon had much too violent a reputation to ever be elected as prime minister in the current environment. But for those of you close watchers of Israel, he was of course wrong. And Sharon was elected. elected Prime Minister. Netanyahu decided to come back and Ariel Sharon put him in as Minister of Finance. This was kind of a keep your enemies closer strategy. The economy in Israel at the time was trash, very terrible. Ariel Sharon thought he was killing two birds with one stone. He was putting Netanyahu in the cabinet, but he was also putting him in a ministry which would trash his reputation forever. Wrong again. Netanyahu did absolute magic in this position. He really turned Israel's economy around. But Sharon did put Netanyahu in an uncomfortable position ideologically. During Sharon's first term, Likud was very ideologically stable. He defeated Ehud Barak using the slogan, Yak Sharon Yavi Shalom, which means only Sharon can bring peace, which would have been concerning to most right-wingers, but given his extremely militant background and his historical reputation as the father of the settlements, Likud members weren't really worried. They saw it purely as an election strategy. However, when it came to his second term, Sharon tried to present as more of a sense interest, trying to get the vote of the Israeli public that still saw him as a warmongering general. This was a turning point for Netanyahu, and this was the moment he moved from Sharon's left to Sharon's right. He committed himself to criticizing every single policy that Sharon brought to the table. Do you think Sharon has gone far enough? Is this what you would have liked to have seen? I hope that uh, the government will indeed take the full action, which means to dismantle the terrorist regime of Yasser Arafat. Keep in mind, at this time, the second intifada is underway. So Netanyahu is able to work his strongest angle, opposition to terror. This is the same savagery that attacked New York and Washington and Moscow and Indonesia. The people of Israel are united to defeat this terror that murders a mother as she protects her two children. Netanyahu played the concerned citizen who constantly implored Sharon to take action, to re-enter the Palestinian cities handed over as a part of Oslo, to militarily isolate the PLO. And when Netanyahu would call, Sharon would respond. Netanyahu pushed Sharon to embark on Operation Defensive Shield, which entailed the IDF re-entering Palestinian cities, confiscating the Palestinian Authority's weapons, eliminating hundreds of Palestinian terrorists, destroying the main PLO headquarters, and placing Arafat under siege. This became the dance of Sharon's second term. Netanyahu would demand and Sharon would act by toughening his policy. And then of course the Palestinians would react. At a teachers conference in 2001, Sharon said, the state of Israel wants to give Palestinians that which no one has ever given them, the possibility of establishing a state. This was not okay in Likud's book and not okay in Netanyahu's book. The right-wing bloc in Likud demanded that the party's central committee convene and vote on the proposition that no Palestinian state would be established. For four months, Sharon and his supporters tried in every possible way to avoid convening the Central Committee. Eventually, the party's internal court forced them to have the vote. 2002, May 12, hundreds of Liquid Central Committee members convened in an auditorium to take this vote. This was the first time the Central Committee of Likud welcomed the Manhagut Yehudit, which was the group formed by Moshe Feiglin. And Moshe Feiglin was like, I know how I'll get to power, I'll join Likud. He took it away from them and gave it to us, period. That's the answer. So the country belongs to us. The land of Israel, of Israel belongs to us because God gave it to us. The Managut Yehudit is more religious, more right-wing, more disconnected from the history of the Likud party, but they worked with the veterans to vote against Sharon's plans. Netanyahu used this meeting to just go at Sharon. He opposed international peace conferences. He got mad about Operation Defensive Shield ending. He stated clearly and definitively a complete opposition to a Palestinian state. He said, I quote, Throughout the years under Begin's government, Shamir's government, and my own government, the Likud was vehemently opposed to the establishment of a Palestinian state in the heart of our homeland. And he reminded the room that the Likud mandate was based on this promise to the public. He also said that Sharon had undermined the democratic foundation of the party by making such an antithetical policy decision without consulting the party first. The committee did vote against Sharon. I don't think it was a personal contest. It was a policy issue where the uh, members of the 
Likud express their desire to fight terror and not to create what they believe would be another terrorist state that would threaten Israel. That's all it was. But polls showed that two-thirds of Likud members supported Sharon and 68% of the Israeli public supported a Palestinian state, with only 28 opposing it. Now we see this swap. Netanyahu has taken Sharon's position on the far right and Sharon has taken Netanyahu's position closer to the center. And what does someone closer to the center do in a situation like this? Well, he ignores the central committee. And he is publicly praised for transcending his extremist and corrupt party. Netanyahu now, with the assistance of Jabotinsky's grandson, starts to present himself as the more authentic representation of Likud's ideology, an activist alternative to Sharon, a leader who will still adhere to Jabotinsky's teachings. And keep in mind, this comes before Netanyahu votes twice in favor of Gaza withdrawal, which I want to look at a bit closer because a lot of people bring this up as evidence that he is willing to make concessions for peace with Palestine. And I just want to have a closer inspection of this period to see Netanyahu's true role. On December 18 at the Hazlia conference, which is this very prestigious annual event where the national policy is set forward by the leadership, Sharon announces that he will be unilaterally withdrawing from Gaza. He elaborated at length, even addressing part of his speech to the Palestinians, saying, I want to לפנות אל הפלסטינים ולומר שוב כפי שאמרתי בעקבה אין לנו עניין לשלוט בכם אנו מעוניינים שתנהלו את חייכם בעצמכם במדינה משלכם מדינה פלסטינית דמוקרטית בעלת רציפות טריטוריאלית ביהודה ושומרון והיגיון הכלכלי המקיימת עם ישראל מערכת יחסים נורמלית של שקט ביטחון ושלום. פנים לא לבצע את חלקם במפת הדרכים, אז תיזום ישראל מהלך ביטחוני חד צדדי של התנתקות מהפלסטינים. מטרתה של תוכנית ההתנתקות היא להפחית ככל הניתן את הטרור ולהעניק לאזרחי ישראל את מירב הביטחון. תהליך ההתנתקות יוביל לשיפור רמת החיים ויעזור לחזק את הכלכלה בישראל. Then in February 2004, he speaks about withdrawal from Gaza again. This time he wasn't as vague about his intentions to dismantle 17 settlements in Gaza and Samaria. The plan was actually supported by more than two thirds of the public because most people didn't like Gaza. They really saw it as more of a security burden. Uh, the public opinion polls, which show a big majority for the withdrawal from Gaza, is not only statistics, but also a reality. I think that it is important that the world will know that uh, we want not only to leave Gaza, but to go for a permanent solution after this withdrawal. But of course, the settlers, the religious students, and the veterans of Likud were all ready to revolt. Well, it's quite clear. The roadmap is not a prescription for peace, but rather for more terrorism. They demanded that the disengagement plan be approved by a Likud referendum. So they had the referendum and the results came out in their favor. 60% opposed the withdrawal. But Sharon just decided uh, he did not care and decided to move forward with it anyway. Let's just be honest about Sharon's intentions when it came to Gaza too. For him, it wasn't so much goodwill or this desire to do something good for the Palestinians. For Sharon, it was very much a refocusing of his strategy to the West Bank. Gaza was getting to a situation where it would have to be annexed. And if it was annexed, that would cause a demographic shift within Israel, as in 2 million Palestinians would become voting Israelis. Better to cut your losses when it comes to Gaza and focus on the West Bank. So Sharon Sharon submits the disengagement plan for the government's approval on June 7, 2004, but he has a problem because he no longer has a majority. He remedies this by immediately sacking two ministers who are very right wing and he knows are very opposed to it. So that's Avigador Lieberman, who's in charge of Yisrael Bet New, and Benny Alon, who's in charge of National Union. I think it's a little chusp from the Prime Minister when he doesn't have majority, he's going to create majority that he doesn't have with firing some of his ministers while telling him in the face that this is a wrong decision. In, uh, instead of convincing those ministers, he's firing them. This is not democracy. 
But even after he just straight up sacked some people, there are still 10 ministers who oppose this withdrawal and they're led by Netanyahu, of course. Netanyahu had been very clear and consistent about his opposition to withdrawal. So that was not going to change. So Sharon tried to compromise. He said, how about we withdraw in stages? He then decided to take this to a Likud referendum and lost, which put all of us who committed ourselves to the results of the referendum in a bind, including him, first and foremost. So the thought was, how can you continue with a pullout when your own party to which you committed to respect its outcome, its decision, decided against the pullout? And that took a while. We worked on that for a while and figured out a, a, a way to, uh, to get to uh, a compromise which essentially said we'll make all the preparations. So Netanyahu and the others agreed thinking plenty of time to stall to stop it but the media obviously presented them as agreeing to disengagement and they're all very upset by this and they kind of decided that wasn't going to happen again. In August of 2004 Sharon invites the Labour government to make a national unity government to try and get this disengagement plan through. I'm very glad about the decision of the Likud party where a majority supported Prime Minister Sharon to move ahead with the plan of disengagement and create a national union government with the participation of the Labour Party. And if you think Likud was angry before, you won't imagine how upset they are now. When he submits the disengagement plan in October, it feels pretty much like a done deal. The only real question is, how will his ministers, including Netanyahu, vote on this disengagement? And this is where people love to tell you, Netanyahu, he voted for the withdrawal. The first vote in the Knesset is in October of 2004. This is widely referred to as the banana push. I don't know why, so do not ask. Moments before the vote on the disengagement plan, Netanyahu and other ministers announced that they will resign in two weeks unless a bill is passed that says the disengagement has to be decided by national referendum. Sharon says, okay. Resign. Netanyahu and his friends panic and rescind their offer of resignation. They vote in favor in the plan and they watch the two ministers who vote against it get dismissed. Because this is essentially the choice they have. If they vote against it, they'll be kicked out of the ministry. Netanyahu does vote in favor of Gaza withdrawal again. He votes in February 2005 in favor of the evacuation compensation bill. And this is really bad for Netanyahu. He becomes a huge target for the media's criticism. Why are you so openly and loudly saying you oppose disengagement from Gaza, but still serve in the government putting it through. Why do you keep voting for it? Mr. Netanyahu was uh, against the disengagement. He described the disengagement as a disaster uh, to the state of Israel and you cannot be a, a minister in the government, a, a very important minister like finance minister on one end and the other end to be against the main, the most important uh, policy of the government as the Prime Minister is leading. And the reality is Netanyahu is in a tough position. He was killing it as finance minister. He had done crazy things to Israel's economy. In Israel to the well, economy. what happened was we were on the brink of financial collapse a year and, um, and a quarter ago when I took over as finance minister. Prime Minister and I worked together. We cut spending, cut welfare, cut the bureaucracy, cut taxes took over the pension funds of the unions, which were in actual bankruptcy, uh, raised the retirement age for men and women, privatized El Al, they've been talking about it for 17 years, it took right. us three months, privatized the shipping company, now we're selling off the banks, the telecoms, making it a very robust dynamic economy. So the results, in short, the economy last quarter grew 5.5%, stock market has more than doubled, it's grown 100% in 12 months, um, our uh, long-term government bond rates have been slashed, that means that people will buy your bonds for lesser interest because they trust you. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, money is flowing in, investment is coming in. Israel is a very, very good deal. So I'm giving you a good stock. And what he wanted to do was finish putting through his economic reforms. He knew that if he voted against the Gaza withdrawal, he would lose his position in the ministry and he would never get to finish the job that he started. He was seen currently by the Israeli public as the Minister of Finance who had saved Israel's economy and he wanted to cement that legacy. And that meant he just had to get a few more policies through. And in order to get those policies through, he had to stay in the government. Voting 
for disengagement was not done because Netanyahu wanted to progress the peace process. It was done because it was a price he was willing to pay to stay in his ministry. I don't care if it's Labour or if it's uh, any other party, as long as we continue the economic reforms to break up the monopolies, streamline the government. Sharon had very much left Netanyahu alone to do whatever he wanted. So the second Sharon started to interfere in his portfolio, Netanyahu completely changed his tune. Even though he voted twice in favor of bills related to disengagement, the Saturday night before the disengagement, Netanyahu resigned. I, I cannot be a partner to a move that I think compromises the security of Israel, tears the people apart, and enshrines the principle of withdrawal to the indefensible 67 lines and uh, I think in the future we'll also risk the unity of Jerusalem. Soon after this, Sharon left Likud to form his own party, Kadima, and he took 14 of Likud's heirs with him. Kadima ends up kind of representing the members of Likud that are interested in moderating and are interested in some sort of peace, but Likud gets pushed into opposition because of this split. The new Likud, Likud in opposition, led by Netanyahu, is decidedly more right-wing and continues to be that way moving forward. Well, I am beginning from this uh day, the uh, journey to bring the Likud back to the leadership of the country. I intend to unite all the forces inside the Likud uh, to uh, rid the party of uh, criminal elements that have uh, entered it and to uh, make the Likud again uh, a central and important force in shaping Israel's future and its security. Netanyahu's first term irrevocably changes the peace process between Israel and Palestine. And I wanted to demonstrate how Netanyahu has been extremely capable at both working toward and against peace simultaneously. And I think Netanyahu has been very clever in terms of what concessions he's been able to get. The agreements that he makes and the terms that he set in his first term dictate the rest of the peace process, not Everyone is an angel. I'm aware that other people make mistakes, but this is a video focused on Netanyahu. When I do videos focused on other people, I will focus on their mistakes. The Y agreement, the Hebron protocol, the Gaza withdrawal, these are not necessarily huge wins. We are moved so far away from the conceptions outlined in Oslo. Keep in mind that in 1998, when the Y agreement occurs, that is the same year that the final status negotiations are supposed to take place. I'm more than happy to do videos on the Camp David talks, on Olmert's offer, on Barak's offer. I'm more than happy to do actual videos on the peace process, but I do not think we can overstate the importance of Netanyahu's first term. In the next video, we're going to look at Netanyahu and Obama and Kerry's attempts at peace. Then we're going to look at Trump. Please like and comment and subscribe because that is the only validation I get. Thank you.